Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Eric Trabert, and thank you for uh, joining today's webinar. I am a director of the Center for Public Health Preparedness and Resilience at CNA, and I'm also serving as the project manager for the Bureau of Justice Assistance COVID-19 Detection and Mitigation and Confinement Facilities Training and Technical Assistance Program. So thank you all very much for joining. As I mentioned earlier, I think we had over 200 registrants. So very excited to see that type of turnout and interest in this program. And our goal today is to give you um, an overview of the program and of the TTA that's available. We will be putting some links in the chat today, so please keep an eye on that. And to start with, we have a link to a sign-in sheet I know many people that are attending the webinar today received the invitation secondhand through other parties. And uh, we'd ask if you would like to go into that sign-in sheet, please, and provide your contact information. That'll make sure that we can send you any follow-up resources, materials, or guidance for the TTA Center, including notifications for future webinars and, and that sort of thing. It would be very helpful. So keep a lookout for that, and please go ahead and, and sign in. Okay, so before we dive into the content, I wanted to go over a few things for today's webinar. Uh, we are recording the webinar for those that were not able to attend, and we will provide that recording as well as a transcript and the slides from today as that will be posted to BJ's project page, and we will send out an announcement once those are posted and available for you. We have also enabled the live captioning function, so if you would like to use that, you should see a button on the uh, lower toolbar on the screen that says live transcript. You can click on that and view subtitles or a transcript from today. As I mentioned before, we're going to be using the chat function quite a bit. So if you have questions while we're going through the presentation today, uh, please submit those in the chat at any time. We do have folks that are monitoring the chat and they will keep track of any questions that are there. We would like to hold answering questions until some designated time at the end of the presentation, but then we'd love to answer or try to answer any questions that folks have. And lastly, we do have a feedback form that we would ask you to complete at the end of the webinar. It's really important for us to get your feedback so we can continuously improve these types of offerings and make sure that we are providing the type of information that's most useful and helpful to you. And on that feedback form, there's also an area for people to submit ideas for topics for future webinars. So we would love to hear any ideas or topics you have to focus future webinars on. So we will also post a link to the webinar feedback form in the chat function and uh, ask that you complete that. So our agenda for today is pretty straightforward. We will have some opening remarks to kick things off from Sarah Sullivan. Sarah is the point of contact for BJA on this DTA program. I will then provide a high-level overview of the program itself and also introduce our project team. I will then turn things over to my colleague, Tammy Felix, and she is the TTA coordinator, and she will talk to you about the types of TTA support and resources that are available and how to access those resources and sort of our general approach to providing TTA through the program. And then as I mentioned, we will have ample time for your questions and also any feedback that folks attending today might have in terms of focus areas for TTA needs in the confinement setting for TTA support. Okay, with that, I will turn things over to Sarah, who, as I mentioned, is a senior policy advisor in the Bureau of Justice Assistance and is the lead uh, government point of contact for the COVID detection and mitigation and confinement facilities TTA Center. Sarah? Thank you, Eric. Really happy to be here and really excited to see the interest and in how many people registered and are participating in the webinar. Just want to thank everyone for joining and excited to share with you the technical assistance that will be available to you. A little bit of background on this project. So this is a partnership between the Bureau of Justice Assistance within the U.S. Department of Justice and the CDC. A series of funds that Eric will talk about later was passed through the American Rescue Plan Act that made funding available to 
state and local jurisdictions to assist with COVID-19. As part of that funding, CDC partnered with BJA to provide technical assistance, not only to recipients of that funding, but to the field at large. So Eric will talk about that funding that's available, but also the TA, that technical assistance that's available to you, regardless of if you are receiving any of those funds. We're really excited that we've been able to bring CNA on board along with their partners at the American Correctional Association and the American Jails Association. CNA and the team has a wide array of expertise, particularly in both public health and specifically infectious diseases, as well as in criminal justice and corrections. And so the marrying of those two experiences, I think will really pose a huge value to corrections facilities throughout the country and to the technical assistance that will be available. We understand, even though we're launching this now, we understand we're two and a half years, almost three years into the pandemic, about a year and a half into the funding being available. But we also know that there are still needs out in the field. We also know that this is a good time to reflect on what's happened over the past three years to really help identify lessons learned that can assist with future planning and discussions on how to make the good changes that have been made sustainable sustainable and how to learn from each other. So I know I've spoken with some of you that are on this webinar. I've spoken over the past year since I've joined BJA with many confinement facilities who over the past year, I've been able to provide some assistance until we were able to get CNA and team on board and I believe some of you have been at some of our recent webinars in June and September, but really excited to have them on board. They have the capacity to provide much more technical assistance than I've been able to just with me as a solo team member until I brought them on board. So happy that they can provide that more comprehensive and targeted technical assistance and training to everyone. With that, I'll be around in case I can help answer any questions throughout the webinar. But with that, Eric, I'll pass it back over to you. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Let's get into it with an overview of the program. As Sarah mentioned, uh, about $700 million in federal funding was provided through the American Rescue Plan Act passed in 2021. And that funding was targeted towards supporting COVID-19 detection and mitigation in confinement settings. The funding was dispersed via an existing cooperative agreement that CDC has known as the ELC cooperative agreement. ELC stands for Epidemiology and Laboratory Capacity for Prevention and Control of Emerging Infectious Diseases. Since that mechanism was already available, it was a quick way to get the funding out to the states. There are 64 recipients of the ELC cooperative agreement, and those are the public health authorities in all 50 states. There are six major localities uh, that you see on the slide there that are also recipients of the ELC cooperative agreement, as well as U.S. territories and freely associated states. So they received the funding. It was based on a formula that looked at the total incarcerated population in each jurisdiction of those 64 divided into the total national incarcerated population. That's how the, the funding was divvied out. As Sarah mentioned, the project period was from August of 2021. That's when the funds originally put out and it extends through the end of July in 2024. Now, when the recipients received that funding, there was explicit guidance attached to that, that they should work with their partners in the states and in the localities to get that funding down to the local level and throughout the state to try to reach the broadest uh, complement of confinement facilities in their jurisdiction. And as Sarah mentioned, because of the target population here being confinement settings, CDC did partner and is working quite closely with BJA to administer this program and also to stand up and operate this training and technical assistance center. So what do we mean by confinement facilities here? The eligible facility types under this cooperative agreement include adult prisons and jails, juvenile confinement facilities, community lockups, and also community confinement facilities as defined in the Code of Federal Regulations 28115.5. Uh, and that includes other facilities such as halfway houses, 
uh, mental health facilities, community correctional facilities that are residential reentry type centers or programs. If you have a question about eligibility from a facility standpoint, you can look under the Code of Federal Regulations or even reach out to us directly with a question. We will be providing an email address that you can use to reach out to us directly with any questions related to eligibility for facility types. Okay, so part of this award, there were 15 allowable activities, and one of those activities was mandatory for all 64 recipients, and that was to use the funding to assist in establishing diagnostic and screening testing programs for residents or inmates or detainees in these facilities, as well as staff or visitors. That was mandatory for all 64 recipients to include in their work plans for this funding. There were also 14 optional activities that they could participate in as part of their work plans for this funding. And I've listed those up here on the slide. There is a guidance document that we will put a link to in the chat. I encourage everyone to read that guidance document. It'll go into some more detail about these optional activities, but they really spread across a broad range of things that you could do with the funding everything from ongoing testing and contact tracing support to using the funding for developing and implementing strategies around quarantine and isolation. Uh, the funding can be spent on things like developing social distancing policies and sanitation policies and also training staff on those policies, as well as best practices in infection control and sanitation and then at sort of a more broad level, the funding can also be used for purposes of emergency planning at the facility level for supporting coordination with public health authorities and for looking at things like development and implementation of policies and strategies around population reduction and diversion. On this slide, I've just included some examples of allowable costs. This is not meant to be an exhaustive list. And again, if you have questions about potential allowable activities or allowable costs with the funding, you can reach out to us directly. We can coordinate with our partners at CDC and BJA and get answers and clarification for you on that. But um, the funding can be used for things like hiring of personnel, whether there's temporary personnel or full-time personnel, entering into contracts with consultant staff to support COVID testing and mitigation. It can be used for things like purchasing COVID testing supplies, masks, gloves, gowns, personal protective equipment of that nature, provided that's, again, being used to support work plan activities related to COVID testing and mitigation. It can be used for retrofitting or doing building renovations to existing structures to help enhance things like physical distancing or isolation and quarantine capability within the facility, or to improve ventilation systems or mitigating the risk of viral transmission in the facility. There are also allowable costs related to purchasing of equipment to help implement some of the strategies related to COVID testing and mitigation. So that could be purchasing tablets to support communications between inmates, detainees, with family or with legal counsel or representatives. It can be used for things like improving or enhancing internet access in the facilities or Wi-Fi. And it can also be used for things like hiring contractors to do needs assessments and then help you implement results of those needs assessments. So if there are certain activities that you want to undertake to improve the mitigation against viral transmission in the facility, and there are related effects on the population in that facility, you can use the funding for those purposes as well. We have produced a frequently asked questions document that we're going to be putting out very soon. And again, if we have your contact information, we'll make sure you all receive that. That also goes into some more detail about allowable activities and allowable costs through the program. By all means, feel free to reach out to us if you have questions and we can help answer those questions for you about a specific activity. So that was just a quick overview of the program itself. I wanted to introduce myself and CNA, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with our organization, and also our team members on this important contract. CNA entered into this agreement with BJA to support the stand-up and operation of the training and technical assistance program. And as Sarah mentioned when she spoke, our services are available to the recipients of the award 
available to subrecipients. So if the health authorities uh, partner with sheriff's associations or with jail administrators down at the facility level to get that funding down, we are there to support them as well. But also importantly, I want to stress that we are here to support facilities that may not be direct recipients of this funding, but may be looking for assistance or resources related to COVID-19 testing and mitigation in their facility. So even if you're a facility that's not receiving direct support or direct funds through this program, you can still reach out to us and we can provide you with resources, uh, best practices, or with support with training or development of, of strategies, anything along those lines. So CNA is a nonprofit research and analysis organization. We've been around since 1942 and we are based in Arlington, Virginia. I've been at the organization for the past 20 years. And as I mentioned earlier, I run CNA's Center for Public Health Preparedness and Resilience. My background is as an epidemiologist, and I've spent my career at CNA really working in the area of public health, emergency preparedness, and response. So in addition to obviously being quite busy over the past three years with COVID-19, including working on over a dozen after action reports and lessons learned reports for national and, and state and local partners. I've also had the ability to participate in response to the H1N1 influenza pandemic, as well as Ebola, Zika, and actually as far back as the original SARS outbreak in the early 2000s. So this is an area that I'm really familiar with and, and feel quite passionate about. So I feel fortunate to be part of this program. But in addition to CNA's public health work, as Sarah mentioned, we also operate centers of expertise in criminal justice and corrections through our Justice Research and Innovation Center, and also in vulnerable population protection. And what was important to us as part of this project was to make sure that the team we put forward brings expertise from those different centers together to support this program because we feel it's really important to have an interdisciplinary perspective coming in to support confinement facilities with COVID uh, detection and mitigation, understanding not just the public health aspect of it, but also criminal justice correction side of it and uh, the work we've done working with vulnerable populations. We also have quite a, a lot of experience supporting national level training and technical assistance programs. So this is one of several national TTA programs that we support through the Department of Justice, and in particular, the Bureau of Justice Assistance. And we also support national trained technical assistance programs through the Department of Health and Human Services. So very familiar with this type of work and what it takes to try to be successful in reaching the end users for these funds. But obviously, we can't do this alone. We're very fortunate to have a wonderful team of partners who are with us in this effort, including the American Correctional Association, the American Jail Association, and the Correctional Leaders Association, all of whom have significant experience in correctional operations and policy, large networks of subject matter experts who have been doing work in this field for decades, and we really are fortunate to be able to draw on that type of expertise. I wanted to call on representatives from each of these facilities just to say a few words about their involvement. Betty, if you don't mind taking yourself off mute and, and saying a few words about ACA's involvement in this project. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we are so excited about being a part of this initiative with CDC and the Bureau of Justice Assistance, CNA, and our other partners, the American Jail Association, and Correctional Leaders Association. We have at the American Correctional Association, we're an accrediting body. We accredit uh, jails and prisons, probation and parole, halfway houses at ACA. And also we have a full-time department with the Office of Correctional Health with seven full-time employees with uh, contract employees additional. Our full-time employees. There's a director of that department who's a physician assistant, along with Masters of Public Health. And for this initiative, we have put together a team to help with this technical assistance training. Two medical doctors and two former secretaries of corrections, one being a health authority and one coming up through the Texas system into Wyoming, Bob Lambert, who's been in corrections many, many years. We have Wendy Kelly, 
who was the secretary of the Arkansas Department of Corrections. Uh, she came up in the system and also was a health authority for the coalition and represented Arkansas as a coalition in the Coalition of Correctional Health Authorities. We have Dr. Jennifer Clark, medical doctor, who was the health authority for Rhode Island Department of Corrections, which is a unified system that represents jails and prisons, worked many years in the unified system as their health authority. And also Dr. Kathleen Maurer, who was the health authority for Connecticut Department of Corrections, also another unified system that represents jails and prisons. ACA represents all of the corrections field from arrest to reentry. And we are very excited that we put together this team along with subject matter experts. For example, Dr. Harbin Steele, the health authority in Nebraska, Tony Wilkes, the chief of corrections for jails in Davison County, Tennessee, Dr. Lynette Lithicum, the health authority and the oldest health authority for corrections in the country with over 35 years experience in correctional health. I think we've really put together a great team with the rest of the excellent expertise at CNA and CLA and AJA. And I look forward to really being able to serve the field through this initiative for training and technical assistance to serve the staff of corrections as well as the population we serve. Thank you very much for including the American Correctional Association in this initiative. Thanks, Betty. We appreciate it. And we appreciate your support as part of our team and, and to the project. I want to see if Chris Daniels is on from the American Jail Association. Chris, if you're on, do you want to take yourself off mute and say a few sure. words? Sure. Thanks, Eric. Hmm? So uh, likewise, American Jail Association is very pleased to play a leadership and supportive role in this initiative. Obviously, this has been an important topic for us for the past couple of years. Um, if you attend our conference, you know that. If you participate in our iConnect discussion forums, you know that. There's been a tremendous amount of discussion and information sharing on our forums in particular. Likewise, we have a team of subject matter experts who are committed to this initiative, and you'll find that there's going to be a lot of discussion about this initiative at our upcoming conference in Omaha in May. That's our annual conference and jail expo. So I would encourage you to join us there if you want to participate in those discussions. We obviously provide in-person training, as most of you probably know, and online training, and we are also able to come out to your facilities and provide training and technical assistance as well. So we stand ready to do that and provide support around this initiative in that way too. Just reach out to me. You can get more information about AJA and all that we do on our website, which is AJA.org. I'd also like to recognize Darren Seeger, our president. He's on the call as well. So I just wanted to acknowledge Darren. And again, we're very excited to participate in this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Finally, from CLA, Stephen Fogg, if you're on, would you like to take yourself off mute and say a few words? Yes, I am on. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy to be here and uh, continuing to partner on this topic. We have been working with CNA in a variety of ways on the topic of COVID-19 and lessons learned, operational changes. But one of the things that we know is that throughout the years, jails and prisons have successfully dealt with contagious hygiene and health issues. And one of the ways that we've done that is that we have provided resources. So this is another opportunity for us to partner with the wonderful people at ACA, AJA, and of course CNA to get resources out to the field, make sure we create that feedback loop to find out what's working, what's not working, and see if we can do what Sarah said earlier, implement sustainable changes. And so this is a great opportunity. We stand ready as a representative to executive leaders in all 50 states, four territories, four large jail systems, and the military correction system to do whatever we can to support this effort. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Stephen. Appreciate that. And just quick thanks to ACA and AJA and CLA for using their networks to get the word out about today's webinar. It was essential for us in terms of trying to reach as many people as possible with this information. So I'm really appreciative of that. Okay, I am going to turn things over now to my colleague, Tammy Felix, who I mentioned earlier is our 
a lead TTA coordinator uh, for this effort, and she's going to walk through with you our approach uh, to delivering TTA and the resources that are available and how to access those. So, Tammy? Thanks, Eric. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tammy Felix. I am a senior research scientist with CNA's Center for Justice Research and Innovation. I've been with CNA for almost 19 years now, and my background is in operations research and analysis with criminal justice agencies and organizations. And also I have a background and experience in emergency preparedness and response. So both of those I think will come in handy as we work through this project here. But I wanted to quickly just review our approach to TTA as you know, Eric and Stephen and Chris and Betty mentioned, we've assembled a really strong team for you all of coaches, analysts, and subject matter experts. Our primary approach is to work directly with the ELC recipients, so the funding recipients, to provide them each with a coach and two analysts to support them. We'll have one analyst with a background in criminal justice and another analyst with a background in public health. So the idea there is that we are actively engaging in outreach now to each of the recipients to get an understanding for where they're at in the funding. You know, the funding I believe was awarded a, a year ago now. And so folks have been out there trying to address all of the issues and challenges around responding to COVID-19 in, in confinement facilities and settings. So we're working now with the 64 ELC recipients to get to understand what their immediate needs are and how we can support them moving forward. So each of the 64 recipients will be assigned a TTA coach and analyst team. And we also have through our network and our partners, a broad field of subject matter experts that can help address any of the needs that may arise as facilities respond to the challenges of COVID-19 detection and mitigation. So as far as TTA engagement, uh, we have three kind of primary approaches to TTA or three levels. There's informational, short-term and comprehensive. And really all this to say is that there's no request too big or too small. If you have a question, chances are somebody else has that question as well. So don't feel like any question wouldn't be worth the time to ask. We really encourage you to reach out to us because again, we're going to be engaging with every state and all the confinement facilities that are within that jurisdiction. So we're going to have access to a wealth of information that chances are if you're struggling with something, somebody else is, and we may already have what could be a great solution for you. So please reach out to us with small questions, or if you have a larger concern, say with con conducting assessments uh, within your facility on your infection control processes. We have a lot of sites that we've already spoken with that are implementing that activity. So there's a lot of good tips and lessons learned from that. So Point being, we want you to reach out to us. We've set up, I believe it's in the chat, an email inbox for the moment until our website is up, but it's bjacdmcf at cna.org. So we ask that you submit your requests to us, and then we will reach out to you to kind of determine, you, is this just something that we can provide you with some information? Is this something that we want to develop a broader engagement plan where we outline kind of what your goals and objectives are, and then we can determine if it requires some on-site support or if this is something that can be done virtually, but we'll work through that with you. So again, please reach out to us and then we can kind of scope that together. So again, in terms of accessing resources, we're currently now out conducting the baseline needs assessment. So really focusing on doing outreach and finding out where we can plug in, where the needs are at the moment. And then we also encourage um, confinement facilities. And I believe Eric mentioned this at the top of the webinar that you don't necessarily have to have or be using the funding that's already been released you can reach out to us with any COVID-19 related question or concern that you may have. So again, as I mentioned, we're doing baseline needs assessments now and developing work plans with each of the ELC recipient sites. And then as part of that, for those of you that are already working with your State Department of Health or Public Health Department, chances are we may have already spoken with you, but don't wait to hear from us. If you need something, we want you to know that you can reach out to us now. Any confinement facility can receive or request support. Just to give you an idea of the types of TTA support that is available. So again, as we engage and as we receive TTA requests and kind of help resolve those issues that you all are facing, we'll have a breadth of knowledge and, and resources available in terms of what your peer agencies are doing and implementing and where they've found successes. 
So we want to be able to share that information with you and provide guidance on the funding available. As this project progresses, we'll be developing a series of webinars that are topically based and again, based on the issues and concerns that we're hearing from the field. If you have ideas or if you have topics now that you know you would love to see a webinar on, we encourage you to let us know that and we can develop that material for you and for the benefit of the field. We can also help with curriculum development and training. And then also we currently have some tools and resources around detection and mitigation strategies. So if that's an area of concern for you, please reach out to us. And then as I just mentioned previously, we have a strong cadre of subject matter experts. So again, there is really probably no issue that you could bring to us that we would not have someone available to work with you and work on that issue through it with you. But again, no request is too big or too small. Our support and services to you are not a requirement of the funding that your state has received and it is free to you. So please, I encourage you to reach out to us and to use us as a resource. And also, I think I brought up a lot of examples of like challenges, but if you have things that are really working well that you know would help others, please reach out to us and let us know that as well. So I look forward to meeting you all in person or virtually someday soon. And thank you for your time. Thanks, Tammy. As you were talking there, it made me think of just that last point, which is one of the things that we want to be able to do through this center's work is capture things that have worked well, innovative practices or exemplary practices that facilities have stood up over the past few years to deal with COVID and that they think are worth sharing with their colleagues and other jurisdictions. We would love to be able to highlight those as best practices or model practices. And that just speaks to the importance of the peer-to-peer -peer piece of this TTA center, which is we want to work to provide opportunities for you to collaborate with your colleagues and other jurisdictions that may be dealing with very similar issues. Along those lines, when we first came on board, we started to engage with the funding recipients and the public health authorities. We understood that they had developed a peer group, essentially, among themselves, that they could talk to one another when they had questions or were facing a challenge and they were looking for someone to talk to about it. This was great. It evolved organically, and we've been able to step in and help facilitate that going forward. But we'd like to do the same thing on the confinement facility side and even bring public health and confinement communities together uh, to collaborate. So shortly, we'll be looking to stand up similar peer groups for correctional facilities. And if this is something that you would be interested in, I encourage you to reach out to us. Right now, as Tammy mentioned, we have an email inbox. You see the email address on the screen. We are in the process of standing up a website, which will be available. You'll be able to submit TTA requests to us directly through the website and also be able to access resources and guidance and things like that through the website. But for now, please reach out to us via the email address that's on the screen and we will follow up with you. And if you're interested in participating in one of those peer groups, let us know and we'll make sure that uh, we include you as those get stood up. I think that's it on my end. We have some time now if there are any questions that were submitted in the chat. Anna, did you have any questions that were submitted in the chat? Yes, there was one question from Betsy Thomas, which I believe Tammy addressed. This question was, we received a subgrant from the Texas Department of State Health Services. Do we need to address questions to them directly? So questions that the facility has? I'm guessing whoever submitted that, do you need to submit questions you have to the to the recipient, to the state health services department? Yeah, Eric, I think that was the thought. So I actually put a response into the chat to let Betsy know that she can reach out to them directly, or okay. you are free to reach out to us and we can facilitate requests. And that goes for everybody, because some of this is going to vary state to state in terms of how the grant recipient wants to handle that. But we're happy to facilitate. Yeah, that's what I was going to mention. We can be the bridge if you would like to you know, do that facilitation or you're welcome to reach out and coordinate with them directly. Were there any other questions in the chat? If not, if anybody has some questions, feel free to take yourself off mute and ask away while we wait for folks to think of some questions to ask. Sarah, was there anything else you wanted to make a point of based on our discussion or anything that we might have missed that you wanted to emphasize? 
Nothing that comes to mind. The only thing I'll say is if you know that you could benefit from assistance, but you're not exactly sure what that would look like. So for example, you know you want to sustain things that you've had in place, but not sure how CNA or the team could help you do that, or you're having some challenges with a potential outbreak, but you don't know how they could assist. You don't need to come with a particular request, like you're asking CNA to do X, Y, Y and Z. You're asking ACA to do X, Y, and Z. You can just come with the problem. You can just come with the issue that you're having, and they will work with you to identify ways that they may be able to assist. So just one thing to know, and feel free to use that email if you're interested to send an email. I'm sure Eric and me and team will follow up with that. Eric had mentioned the peer group that has been put together for the health departments. And he may have also mentioned that we've been thinking about putting something together similar for confinement facilities. So if you are interested in being connected with other confinement facilities around the country to talk about lessons learned, to talk about challenges you're facing, to talk about maybe there's something exciting that you're doing that you think others will be interested in. That is a group that CNA will be putting together. And if you're interested in it, more information will come out. But preliminarily, if you're interested in it, feel free to shoot an email to that CNA email to kind of get you started on that list. Got a couple questions came through. Oh, here's one. What are BJA and CDC's plans to ensure that each ELC provides funding to the fullest complement of facilities in each jurisdiction? Sean, thank you for your question. So for each of the ELC recipients, they had to submit their project plan and their budget for how they are going to use those funds. Those plans and budgets were reviewed by both CDC and BJA in order to ensure that it met the requirements of the funding. So many recipients, we highlighted that it was not clear how they were working with local jurisdictions to ensure the fullest complement of facilities are reached in this jurisdiction. Now, this doesn't mean that they have to reach every single facility in the jurisdiction or that every facility in that state will get funding. It just means that they have to, one, make sure that they're covering the array of confinement facility types. They can't just give all the money to the State Department of Corrections and call it a day, right? They have to be working with local leaders, local criminal justice partners in order to assess the needs in the local facilities and identify ways that the funding could help assist those facilities, as well as juvenile facilities, community corrections, facilities. That's kind of some of the processes that are put in place. And we've been working with quite a number of recipients to help them think through what is the best way for them to reach local facilities. So I hope that answers your question. And it looks like there were two more questions that popped into the chat. One before I dropped the feedback form. This was somebody who asked if there was any chance that the grant dates for spending will be extended as they were not able to get all up and running and cannot fully complete in the deadline. I believe that's from a subrecipient of Alabama's Department of Public Health. Thank you for asking that question. Um, I've been working with CDC to try to figure out the answer to that exact question. I have that exact question as well. Will there be a possibility for no cost extensions? I'm still working with them to figure out if that's possible. But if you're registered for this webinar, then you are on our email list. So when information like that comes out, you will receive that information. That kind of information might go directly to your recipient and it would be up to them if you are a subrecipient in order to share that information. But hopefully that will be coming out shortly. We know that there were a lot of delays in getting some of the funding out, getting contracts in place, et cetera. So we understand that that's an issue and we're gonna see what we can do to see if it's possible to extend or not. We just have to look, I think, to see if there are any legislative um, requirements that might limit us from doing that. And there was one more follow-up question. If the presentation slides would be distributed, to which Tammy just replied that the webinar is being recorded and both the slides and the recording will be made available to all registrants. So. And I did want to just 
foot stomp something Sarah said, which is if you're unsure of whether we have your contact information, say someone passed along a notice of this webinar today, you didn't formally register for it, please use the link that was provided in the chat to sign in. Uh, you could also just email us directly to the email that's on the slide right here with your name and contact information, because we want to make sure that when we do have resources to put out or guidance, for example, CDC just updated its guidance in late November. And so we were able to blast out just a quick summary of what that guidance said and how it changed from previous guidance. So things like that, we want to make sure we're reaching as, as broad an audience as possible. But we do have a listserv set up. And when we publish frequently asked questions or fact sheets or anything along those lines, we want to make sure that you're able to receive those materials. So um, please reach out to us and make sure we have your contact information. I see another question came through that I think is for me. I understand that some states have not accepted these funds. If there are monies left over, will the balance of the 700 million be distributed? So to date, only one recipient has not accepted the funds. I don't know what's going to happen with that funding. If I get clarity on what's going to happen and that's something that I can share, we will definitely make sure to include that in future communication, especially if that will impact the um, amount of funding that other recipients receive. One other thing I wanted to chime in with while we're here is facilitating the peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. Another thing we want to be able to do as a TTA center is, is work with facilities to assess the impact that different activities are having within the facility so we can identify things that are working well and things that may need to be changed. So as you think about activities that you might want to do, we also have staff that can help work with you around identifying performance measures or an assessment strategy so that we can take a look at how things are working and whether it's having the desired impact. Any other questions? Another funding question. As we see the landscape change and other opportunities for mitigation emerge, can our request for funding be amended? Yes, it can. Well, I should say as far as BJA and CDC are concerned, it can. It is up to the recipient if they want to submit a request for a funding change. So if you are a subrecipient, and you want to make a change in the use of your fund, the first line of contact would be your recipient to talk to them about that being a possibility. And it'll be up to them if that's something that they want to approve on their end, and then they would submit it to us for approval. But yeah, I would say on a monthly basis, we get redirect requests because people are identifying different needs that they have or something is coming in under budget and they want to redirect the funding somewhere else. Any other questions? Eric, can you hear me? Hi, Darren. Yes, I can. Hey, I know some questions were coming in. It seems like there's a pause. I just want to say on behalf of the industry, just want to thank, you know, Sarah from OJP and, and you, Eric, and Tammy from CNA for supporting the industry and working hard to get us resources and help us where we need help. It takes a lot of work. I know you guys make it look very easy on this video conference here, but I know there's a lot that goes into it and it's as good as how hard you guys work to help us get things done. So just want to say thank you. Thanks, Darren. Appreciate that. We want to do whatever we can to support, like you said, whether that's through uh, subject matter expertise or resources or, or what have you. So I uh, appreciate the compliment. If there are no other questions, we do have a few minutes here. If anybody does have feedback that you think would be useful in terms of specific focus areas where TTA is uh, really needed right now in the field, we would love to hear that. If you're not comfortable saying that as part of the webinar, feel free to reach out to us through the project email site because any guidance you can provide on where the needs are right now will be really helpful to making sure we're using our time and resources most effectively. Likewise, I should say too, as we mentioned earlier, we're very interested in lessons learned, best practices, and that sort of thing. So if you feel you're doing something really well and it's working quite good for you, and I know I mentioned this earlier, but you think somebody else would benefit from it, we would love to hear that. We can talk about ways to get that information out to the broader community, whether it's through a case study or through a future webinar where we profile practices that seem to be working well. Hey, Eric, this is Brandon Hogg from Indiana. Hey, Brandon. Hey, so is this webinar going to be sent out after it's completed? Because I've missed part of it because I was on a phone call and then I got pulled away for another call. So I missed part of this aspect of it. But 
When I'm seeing some of the participants on this, I see potential sheriffs, jail commanders on there. So I really would love to actually hear their feedback from the correction side of how this collaboration could even work better. Um, I think also when we talk about bringing parties in, because we have are the health departments assisting on this ELC grant, working with confinement spaces, but also trying to bring in their medical personnel as well, because there's always been that miscommunications from the health department to medical and to the sheriff or jail commander. So trying to bridge those general communication gaps. Thanks, Brandon. Yes, the, the webinar is going to be made available. The slides, the transcript of the webinar and, and a recording will be made available shortly after today. We have to go through and, and do the transcript, which takes a little bit of time. But once we get that posted, we'll send a, a notice out to everybody on how they can access that. And your second point there made me think of something, which is that our team will be down at the ACA annual meeting later this month. So if you're going to be in attendance and you would like to meet up and talk to us, feel free to shoot us an email and we can uh, coordinate and see if there's time to get together. That includes two of our four TTA coaches that are going to be there as well. So it's a good opportunity for us to meet with folks from the field and get some feedback. We're also going to be hosting a session while we're down there to get feedback from correctional health authorities on lessons learned from COVID, which to your point, is going to be, I think, really instrumental in hearing on the correctional health side, what are some of the challenges and some of the lessons learned and exemplary practices that were put in place, and what are some things that uh, may be important to sustain going forward. So I hope that helps uh, in, answer your question. Yes, thank you. Okay, if there's nothing else, it's close to the top of the hour. Just a few next steps I wanted to talk to everybody about. We'll beat this over the head. <laughs> Here is, again, our project email inbox. Don't hesitate to use it. If you have the webinar feedback form, please complete that. Any feedback or guidance you have on how to make these better, more useful uh, to you, or any future topics you would like to see covered, we're really interested in getting your feedback. I mentioned earlier, we put together several fact sheets and, and FAQs regarding this program that will be coming out very shortly. And if we have your contact information, we'll make sure that you are uh, in receipt of those once they are ready to go out. And we'll be looking to schedule some future webinars coming up. We've come across through our baseline needs assessments, things that we think are interesting that the broader community might want to learn about. So we will be developing a schedule of some future webinars and topics, and please be on the lookout for those. We would love to have good participation in those as well. And finally, we have started to put together a pretty comprehensive resource library looking at resources for COVID detection and mitigation that were already out there in the public domain. So we want to provide access to you for those. And then of course, as we develop resources throughout the course of this project, we'll be adding those to this resource library so they're available to other folks who are part of this grant. Okay. Just one final comment or thought. We know that historically there's been limited opportunities for confinement facilities, corrections facilities to access federal funds and to access technical assistance federal technical assistance as well. We heard you, we heard the field, and that's why CDC and us work closely together to get this project up and running in order to be able to make a pathway to have this earmarked funding available to confinement facilities, as well as this technical assistant. So know that the feedback just generally that you provide to folks at um, BJA and at DOJ is, is heard and listened to. And, you know, when we are able, we take action in order to make sure that we can meet the needs of the field. Thank you for your feedback and really excited to engage with you all. Thanks, Sarah. And thank you, everybody who was able to participate today. Really appreciate it and look forward to working with you on this important topic. So take care, have a good rest of your week, and uh, hopefully we'll talk soon. Bye now.